Um, as those of you uh, who follow our event schedule here know, uh, we've had a number of, of recent talks uh, featuring authors who've written about some of the biggest intelligence and national security controversies under President George W. Bush. Uh, these have included such, such issues as the NSA's um, warrantless surveillance efforts, uh, the CIA's targeted killings using drones, uh, and the government's rendition, detention, and int interrogation programs. Um, well, this evening, we're very fortunate to have with us someone who, at very high levels of the government, dealt directly with these contentious matters uh, or their aftermath, a retired General Michael Hayden. Uh, Mike had been a, a career intelligence officer in the Air Force when, uh, towards the final years of the Clinton administration, he was tapped to become the head of the National Security Agency. He held that role for about six years and, until about the middle of the uh, Bush administration uh, when um, he, he then uh, uh, served for a year as principal deputy director of national intelligence uh, and moved from there uh, in 2006 to C CIA director. Uh, where he stayed uh, until the uh, start of the Obama administration. Since leaving government service, he's been a principal at the Chertoff Group, a security consulting firm, uh, and a teacher at George Mason University, as well as a member of some boards. Um, but not one to sh shy away from a, a good debate. Uh, he's jumped back into public and into the ongoing national arguments over surveillance drones and the government's other counterterrorism programs uh, by writing a book, Playing to the Edge, in which he gives uh, his side of the story. As the book says on its jacket, uh, Mike offers no apologies, no excuses, just what happened and why. Uh, so I anticipate uh, we're going to have a um, pr pretty spirited discussion, uh, and there will be t time for questions. Let me just encourage uh, everyone who has something to say or asked to put it in the form of a question, uh, and please keep it concise. Um, Mike will be in conversation initially with Scott Shane, a New York Times reporter who covers national security. Scott has worked for the Times uh, for over a decade, but has been writing about intelligence matters for much longer. Uh, more than 20 years ago, when he was with the Baltimore Sun, Scott co-wrote a six-part explanatory series on uh, the NSA, more recently, uh, he came out last year with a book, Objective Troy, which tells the story of Anwar al-Alaki, uh, al uh, the prominent terrorist and U.S. citizen who was killed in a drone strike five years ago, the first U.S. citizen hunted and killed by his own government since the Civil War. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming General Michael Hayden and Scott Shane. said it's symbolic that I'm on the left. <laughs> I should be in the middle. <laughs> Thanks to this huge crowd <laughs> uh, turning out for, for General Hayden, um, I'm going to uh, ask him a series of questions, and, uh, and then eventually we'll, tu we'll turn over to you guys. Um, uh, you know, I started covering Mike Hayden when, uh, when he arrived at NSA, basically. I was working for the Baltimore Sun at the time. And uh, I think I wrote three or four profiles of General Hayden over the years, both for the Sun and then later for the Times. And I do remember one of the memorable things from that was calling your brother <laughs> and saying, hang on a second, because uh, he had to pull his tractor trailer over to the side of the highway <clears throat> to take the call. Um, and, uh, you know, that told me something about uh, Mike's background. He obviously has had an extraordinary career, um, really kind of unparalleled in the history of intelligence. Uh, and, and I think uh, he's also, uh, since he left uh, government, he's had a higher profile and more sort of public accessibility than, than uh, probably any of his predecessors in the jobs that he's held. Um, undoubtedly, I've written some things that you found uh, dim-witted, ill-informed, or plain hopeless. And I know that I disagree with you about some of the things I covered. Um, 
including some very serious things, uh, about, uh, such as interrogation, torture, and the sort of the story of that program. Uh, but I must say that in an age when too many U.S. officials, especially on the security side, uh, and even members of Congress seem to have little appreciation for the role of the press in our society, uh, in, and in particular in covering the secret activities of government, um, Mike Hayden has been uh, different. Uh, you know, around my office, we sometimes have chuckled at his uh, fondness for sports metaphors, and if you mention Hayden, uh, someone is bound to talk about chalk on his cleats, which, which is sort of the uh, origin of the, of the uh, title of his book. Um, but uh, I have always been appreciative of uh, his willing to engage. Uh, you know, as a reporter, I put a high uh, value on that. Uh, I, I read the book over the last uh, week or so, and I found it fascinating, um, particularly uh, to see from the inside things I was covering from the outside. Uh, I appreciated the uh, some perhaps surprising remarks he made from time to time about the excessive secrecy <laughs> about, uh, you know, on the part of the government, especially about the, on the part of the intelligence agencies, and your skepticism about some of the leaked prosecutions under Obama. Um, I was also amazed at how much you got past the CIA <laughs> censors, particularly about drones. Um, where you know, you know, me and my employer were in court for four years trying to get a legal opinion on uh, on the drone strike that killed Anwar Aliki, and uh, so so I was impressed with how much he uh, he he got through the um, through there. I was also struck by something that you told the the NSA workforce two days after 9/11, which uh, was you and I can and will preserve American liberty, and we will do it by making America feel safe again. That was, um, I think, a surprisingly complex thing to say uh, two days after 9-11. Um, with that, let me just plunge right into the thicket of controversy. Um, uh, that sends the air of good feelings Yeah, exactly, up here. exactly. <laughs> That's the pivot. Um, you describe in great detail the Stellar Wind program, what is often uh, referred to uh, by the press as the NSA uh, warrantless wiretapping program and, and so on, but it was basically a, a package of programs that was NSA's response to 9-11. Um, bypassing the FISA law that required court orders and keeping it uh, secret has not worked out so well in, in retrospect. <coughs> First there was the leak to the Times, uh, subsequently Edward Snowden sort of hitting like a tsunami. In retrospect, would it have been better to go to Congress at, right after 9-11, when Congress was probably in a very cooperative mood, and ask for the changes in the law that, that you uh, ultimately, that the agency ultimately got anyway? Yeah, there, there are lots of arguments for that, Scott. All right. Um, one of them is that, yeah, we would have gotten it by simply asking. Um, th that really wasn't my choice, all right? So I'm, I'm reflecting why I think the decision was made not to do that. And, and I think the premium was placed on um, this is a program that's best done without alerting the adversary that you're doing this. I mean, there, there's reason to believe that, that Al Qaeda <laughs> thought the American telecommunications network was an absolute safe haven for them, all right? And, and we squeeze that on the edges, and we can talk a little bit about how much we squeeze, because I actually think it was you know, appropriate and lawful and effective. But, but we did squeeze that, and we did not want to alert them to the fact that we had authorities that we had not historically had. So that, that was the logic. Over the long term, now it's in, I, I describe this in some detail. Once we got the green light from President Bush, it was the agency that said, we got to go tell Congress. And, and we, got, we got the okay, it was about three weeks, all right? But we got the okay to tell Congress, Congress in quotes, not 535 people, all right? We, we told four, and it gradually expanded. I think by the time you all wrote about it, we had two dozen members of Congress who, who were fully witting uh, of the program. In retrospect, I don't know that I would have gone for the legislation, but I would not have gone for the gang of four. I would have gone to brief both <coughs> oversight committees in their entirety. Uh, the House Committee, which is 22 folks, the Senate Committee, which is 15, and that's, you know, that's 37, so you increase the chances of leaking. But at the political level, I think we would have been on more stable ground 
the, the more people we have. There's, there's a line in the book that reflects my background as an airman. If you want people to be with you at the crash, you got to put them on the manifest. Okay? And we didn't do that. Exactly. Uh, now, now this is the <coughs> toughest one, I think, um, uh, uh, for, for me at least. Um, you, you know, it, it always puzzled me that when you got to CIA, uh, you know, by then the really rough uh, of, uh, stuff that CIA was doing to Al Qaeda suspects at the you know secret overseas jails was over, uh, had been over for some time. Uh, and you had the option of sort of saying, you know, that was uh, what happened after 9-11. We're mm -hmm. turning the page. Uh, we're leaving it behind and moving on. Um, you didn't have to embrace, in other words, the entire program, interrogation program. Uh, but you did. Uh, and, and I'm sure that showed a certain um, loyalty to the, uh, to the employees of CIA. Um, but, but waterboarding had been a notorious torture method from the Inquisition through Paul Pot. There's one in Phnom Penh in the, in the um, you know, prison museum there. Um, and, and, you know, I was struck by later, I mean, you, you defend all that stuff within, within limits. Um, you, you say it was effective. Uh, and, you, you know, when you get, when I, I was struck a couple chapters later when I got to your meeting with the young Afghan intelligence chief. Yeah. And you say, uh, he was, you know, a good guy, spoke English. He, we, we could sort of help him, you know, learn how to deal with things. We, we could um, get his service to respect basic human rights. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> my question would be, my questions would be, did he ever ask you about waterboarding? And, and if he had asked you about the enhanced interrogation stuff, would you have argued that all of that was compatible with basic human rights? Yeah, great question. And Scott's referring to a, a very young man, uh, still a young man, named Amrullah Saleh, who was a Panjshiri Tajik working for a Pashtun president. Mohammed Karzai. So that's a very unusual circumstance. So you get a sense as to how much confidence Karzai had in this in this very young fellow. And you're right. I mean, he was self-taught in English. He was he, he had an appetite to learn. He he eliminated most of the ghosts on the payroll to the best of <laughs> to the best of our knowledge. So you know, he eliminated corruption. He was a guy we could trust with authority and knowledge because we we, we would not have expected him to have misused it. All right. So. With that in mind, would I have told him about what it was we did in, in our black sites? Uh, the answer is probably no, and actually he would never ask. All right, they're, they're, I mean, it's, it's considered not according to protocol <laughs> to go into another security service's internal workings. So that, for example, I'm, I'm speeding ahead, but all right, somebody was killing Iranian scientists. All right. I had a broad thought as to who it might be. I never raised that with any foreign partner. A foreign partner brought photos into me of a near complete nuclear reactor in the eastern Syrian desert. All right? I never asked them how he got the photos. It, you, just, you just don't do it. If he wanted me to know, he would have told me. All right? so, so now, admittedly, You've got this, Amarola, we really want you to respect human rights, and then you've got this record over here of what CIA was doing. Uh, obviously, the, the way to square the circle is what we thought we were doing was consistent with U.S. law and with U.S. responsibilities under international treaties. That is, I understand, a very contentious statement. But the challenge we had, Scott, is that we went to the umpire. You know, you, you can just, you can say it was a bad call, ump. You know, his foot was off the bag, ump. But if the ump calls it an out, it's an out. And in the American system, in the American political process, all right, the person who calls balls and strikes is the Office of Legal Counsel at the Department of Justice. And on multiple occasions, all of them before I got there, and Scott's right, most of this is, is history before I get there. And I'll, and I'll answer your question as to why I didn't stop it entirely. Right? The Department of Justice said this did not violate either American law or American responsibilities under international law. Very controversial. 
But now put yourself in the position of the agency after the next catastrophic attack and be there in front of your friendly members of the Senate Select or House Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence. And let me, let me get this right, Mr. Director. You had this guy. You thought he knew this life-saving information. The Department of Justice said these techniques over here were perfectly lawful. And tell me again why you didn't do it. These are all tough choices. All right? They're all very tough choices. Now, why didn't I, um, why didn't I pull it back? Because I went to CIA in May of 2006. Um, I spent the summer of 06 getting a graduate degree on renditions, detentions, and interrogations. I went to school on the program. I mean, this is history. This is before I got there. And over the summer, I devised a way forward that I briefed within the administration, first to Steve Hadley, then to the vice president, then to the president, comprised the following steps. Number one, we got to empty the black sites. We are the nation's intelligence service. We are not the nation's jailers. Right? Now, I get it. Everybody in, that, in those sites still had some intelligence value. So it wasn't zero, but it was low enough that other broad considerations convinced me we no longer needed to keep them. So we convinced the president to empty the sites. I also convinced the president to go full money to the full committees. And beginning in September 2006, we gave to the best of our ability a complete rendition, to use the word, of what CIA had been doing at the black sites. The only thing we didn't tell them was where the black sites were. And when they pressed me as to why we didn't, I said the president didn't know either. And that seemed to kind of stop the, 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 the conversation. Now, parallel to this, Scott, I'm sorry, it's a long answer, but it, 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 okay. parallel to this, the, the army, is, is America's army, is trying to make peace with you for the genuine abuses that took place at Abu Ghraib. And the army is rewriting the army field manual. And they are, they are creating, it is, it is today, a, a very conservative document, more conservative than the document that it replaced and which had been the Army Field Manual on the subject for decades. All right. So I've, I've got America's military, for reasons that should be obvious, and Abu Ghraib and so on, going to a, to a, a very modest set of techniques in order to inter interrogate enemy combatants. I said to the president, based on that, and frankly on, on the rationale that you need to keep your options open, although we would empty the black sites, I wanted to keep them open, but I wanted the option to be able to put people in them. We had 13 techniques. Mr. President, I think we can, we can skinny it down to six or seven, but before we decide, I want Congress in on this, and I want to brief them on what it is we were doing. And I outline in the book in great detail that Congress was of absolutely no use in trying to develop a consensus. There's a line in the book that they spent so much time yelling at me and yelling at one another that they had no influence on the program going forward. They lacked the courage or the consensus to stop it, amend it, or endorse it. So we suggested seven. Uh, we took one off the table because Condi and Steve Hadley were uncomfortable with it, and we kept six. And the six were two slaps, one in the face, one in the tummy, two grasps, one in the chin, one in the lapel. I irreverently say I had all that happen to me in Catholic grade school, all right? <laughs> and then two far more serious ones, I, diet manipulation and sleep deprivation. And then we decided that these were the things we wanted to keep in our kit. So, so the answer is, Scott, in conscience, given my responsibility for the safety of the republic, I could not walk away from the program, even though on a personal basis, it would have made me seem like a white knight to a lot of people. OK, thanks. There's so much to cover here. I'd like to follow up. I'd like to ask a few follow-ups, but I got to put my reporting hat away. Um, you, you know, you talk about something, a, a very interesting, two interesting parts about the uh, campaign against terrorism, or what do we call it these days. Uh, you call it the close fight versus the deep fight. The close fight basically being short-term actions to prevent attacks on the U.S. 
And what you call the deep fight, if I understand it correctly, is the longer term sort of strategic effort to, um, to reduce the size of the enemy, put the U US in a, in a safer position. Um, I think a lot of experts, correct me if you disagree with this, I think a lot of experts would say that the US is a lot safer today from a large scale mm -hmm. attack than it was on 9-11 um, for a lot of reasons. But I think the same experts would also probably say that the number of Muslims worldwide who believe, the U believe that the U.S. is at war with Islam and that violence is justified against Americans or against America, uh, you know, in, in response um, is probably bigger, maybe much bigger than it was on 9-11. And, you know, the, the answer to, um, to the, the threat of, of violence, of killing from al-Qaeda, now ISIS, has by and large been killing Muslims, which is the core of their argument. Um, and so the, uh, you know, I mean, so that's certainly- That's record They've killed far more Muslims than we have. Oh, absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Right. But they have, you know, folks to point with, you point to from Iraq, from Afghanistan, from the drone war. Uh, and, and, you know, you said something, uh, you quote yourself as telling Rahm Emanuel, uh, you know, in your last few um, weeks in office, uh, you know, you stayed on at the CIA uh, until Leon Panetta was confirmed. So you're talking to the president's chief of staff, and he's uh, praising you for a CT success, a counterterrorism success, a, d a drone strike. Uh, but you say to him, unless we change conditions on the ground, we're going to get, we're going to, get to kill people forever. Pretty striking thing to say. Um, what do you what do you make of, of yeah. this contrast sure. between oh. the, the what you call the close fight and the deep no, fight? No, and that's why. I, and, and how's sure. it going? And what do we do about yeah. it? So I mean, that's that's why I wrote the book to, 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 to you know to, to say this is not this is not cartoonish, all right. This is a sea of gray, and you know not the forces of light and the forces of darkness. This hard stuff. So to, to kind of rehearse very briefly what you just said, American military thinks of the fight close and deep. All right. Uh, in in the old Soviet era, it was holding at the Fulda Gap. Any veterans in the room know know what I mean by that? While we had this long-term ideological fight against the Soviet Union because communism was a really bad philosophy, right? Close fight, deep fight. In this war, all right, the close fight is taking care of the guy who's already convinced he wants to come kill you and your family. All right, metaphorically, it's the guy coming through the perimeter war. The deep fight is the production rate of people who want to go come and kill your family in three, five, or 10 years. There's, an, there's a certain sense of urgency to the close fight, all right? So when we convinced the Bush administration that America had to a, had a turn the rheostat up on targeted killings, and we did that in the middle of 2008, we knew all about the close and deep fight. We always knew that there were primary, secondary, and tertiary effects to killing somebody along the Afghan-Pakistan border, all right? The immediate effect was, he's not going to come kill you. But we knew there were second and third order effects. Second and third order effects like you kind of live the jihadi recruitment video, all right, the, the, our narrative. Um, third order effects like there isn't a friend of the United States who believes our legal theory for targeted killing is correct, with the possible exception of Israel, all right? Although in the last four months, the Brits went ahead and did it against a British citizen, too. So. But at the time, we, we, we had a unique, I think correct, but a unique legal interpretation of the war. We always knew the second and third order effects were there. We're not stupid. But the compellence of the need to defend American forces in Afghanistan, and more importantly, defend the homeland, made the primary effect the compelling effect. But I, I say in the book, you know, said to Rahm Emanuel, you, you can't do this forever at the perimeter wire. You got to worry about the production rate and how you do the deep fight, how you do the close fight affects the deep fight. You got to keep this in mind. Now, after we left, all right, the Obama administration kind of ratchets this things up. By 2009, they were, they were striking at about the same rate of the Bush administration. 2010, they hit a knee in the curve. 2011, it continues to go up and then it goes down, all right? I actually had this debate with Fareed Zakaria, with uh, Richard Haas sitting where you are, the president of the Council on Foreign Relations, and, and, and Richard summarized it closely, because Fareed was asking the same questions. 
And Richard said, Fareed, we all understand there are multiple effects here. But with regard to targeted killings, what America needs here is a dial, not a switch. And I think that's a, that's a fair summary of, of what, what we need to do. Look, we have a right to defend ourselves, even if it makes some other people mad. So I want to ask you, ask you about secrecy, um, you know, the bane I of, can't talk of journalists. can't about that. <laughs> <laughs> you do take a few um, almost journalistic uh, swats at excessive secrecy, and you have a whole chapter in your book on the – a uh, Syrian nuclear reactor that um, <laughs> had some bombs dropped on it um, by Israel, but you can't say Israel. Um, and you also talk about the linguistic pretzels that are required of people like you to talk about drones and drone strikes. And I think if I think you could actually do a close analysis of, of your chapter on drones and find some very fancy footwork um, to get you past the Thank you. PRB. <laughs> the Publication Review Board at the CIA, which has to approve all this stuff. Um, and, and, and of course, a guy like me finds all of these restrictions to be ridiculous. How do you see it? Uh, is, is the classification system broken? I mean, why, why should Americans not know the legal arguments justifying targeted killing, if, even if they can't know all of the intelligence sources and methods yeah. that drive? Uh, drive the, the strikes. I mean, what, what, how'd the system get this way and, and how do you fix it? Yeah, I, first of all, more often than not, I agree with you, all right? Because when we're in this condition, all right, I am unable to explain or defend what the folks who are committed to keeping you safe actually do and why. I've got to say, well, I can't confirm it or not. I mean, and, and, and frankly, you deserve better and, and they really deserve better in terms of articulating. By the way, I still get it. I could get it all done with and just go full money and you know it all and you still say, I still don't like that, Hayden. I get that. Fair, fair response. But there you are. You're forced to fill in the blank. And what happens when we leave a gap, no offense, but a lot of journalists run, run the story to the darkest corner of the room. They assume the very worst. Guilty as charged. <laughs> okay. because, because we live in a political culture that distrusts secrecy. And therefore, assumes the worst. So I'm I'm with Scott on this. We should we should be far more open. Here's I, I the, about the last third of the book. I, I really take this on, and, and if you haven't read it, I'll, I'll be very efficient. But there's a story in there where I go to Carly Fiorina, who is who is running my advisory board at CIA. All right, I, the advisory board really good people and they really help. I gave Carly and her small team the toughest problem I had. Carly, here's the problem: Will America be able to conduct espionage or covert action in the future? inside a broader political culture that every day demands more transparency and more public accountability from every aspect of national life. They go away, they study it, they come back four months later, they're sitting in my office right across from, sitting in my conference room across from my office on the eighth deck at Langley. I walk over, okay, okay Carly, will America be able to come? Kind of and she looks me square in the eye and said, too close to call. Okay? Which is a really powerful response. We are now in a political culture that demands a higher level of transparency in order to get legitimacy from you. I'm, I'm mixing storylines here, but Snowden, Stellar Wind, metadata, all right? That gets shoved out the door, and a lot of people in this country start to hyperventilate about it. And it really took NSA off guard. I'm, I'm retired, OK? I'm, I'm just watching from the outside. But it took, re really took NSA off guard. You're on Fox News talking about it. Yeah, well, no. <laughs> uh, yeah, actually, I was because the administration wasn't, mm -hmm. all right, and to, to drive home the point. But, but here here's, was NSA's dilemma. I said, wait a minute. We're good to go. The president has authorized this. Congress has legislated it. The intel committees actually supported it. All right, and the court oversees it. That's the Madisonian trifecta. I got all three branches. We're, we got no issues here, don't worry about it. And as it turned out, a lot of people, and not many of them were wearing tinfoil, I mean a lot of solid people, all right, simply said, what you just described may constitute consent of the governors, but it doesn't constitute consent of the governed. You may have told them, but you didn't tell me. And what I just told you about, oversight committees, president, court, that was the grand compromise in 1970. That was the magic key to transparency in 1970, that you don't let the president do it himself. 
that you, that you pull in the other political branch and the courts. By the way, we're still the only Western democracy that does that. All right? so, and so our line of departure for more transparency, we are way in front of even our European friends. Sorry, long answer, and I know we're going to get to more questions. But the punchline is, my guys are going to have to accommodate to your culture. It's not the other way around. What you define as sufficient knowledge in order to give this enterprise legitimacy is what my guys are going to have to live up to. And that's why I call for more openness. Yeah, I mean, when Snowden you know, dumped his documents, uh, it turned out that about half of the public and about half of Congress was uneasy with some of that stuff. Yeah. And NSA really had no way of knowing that, that uh, without, without getting it out there. Uh, I have two, two more questions. Maybe we can keep it pretty oh, sorry, compact I, yeah. so we can get out to the, to the people who braved the hurricane to get here. Um, you know, there's something like a dozen countries that have armed drones now, and it's growing with every month. You know, I, I was told recently there are six that have actually um, carried out strikes now. Um, that surprised me, uh, yeah. but uh, but it, obviously drones are are proliferating uh, very rapidly. When the you know we we have set the model for the rest of the world. When the Russians kill a Chechen, some Chechen uh, militants in Georgia, or when the Chinese kill um, some Uyghur militants or alleged militants in Kazakhstan with, using drones, you know what are you going to say? Uh, those are those are really well chosen examples. <laughs> they they re they really are because they, those, those are plausible, those are plausible actions. Yeah, uh, I, I get it. Um, I, I told you, n nothing we did was free. Everything we did had trade-offs. We looked at a reality of a force we thought threatened the homeland in what they believed to be sanctuary, right? Out of the reach of a government, or frankly, a government wasn't caring about reaching to them. And so we made the choice to go after them with the system of choice, which was first Predator and then Reaper, GBU-12s and, and, and Hellfire missiles. We, we did it in conscience. We did it very carefully with that in mind, Scott, that you know we're breaking trail here. And so the degree we can be exquisite in our targeting, that's what we had to be, not just b because of the moral requirement, but because we would then be setting the standard for the rest of the world. We got it. We did it. All actions have consequences, some intended, some expected, some unintended, some unexpected. We knew. So my last question for you will be, um, you, you write in the book uh, of the tr what you call, the, there's a quote, troubling American habit confined largely to political elites of complaining that intelligence agencies has not, have not done enough when they feel in danger and then complaining that they have done too much when they're feeling safe again. And uh, believe me, you could certainly add the, you know, the, the media, um, you, you know, in, the, in with the political elites. Um, but isn't that really the way our system is designed? It, it's annoying, but it's a dynamic system. The pendulum swings. Yeah. And, you know, <clears throat> and, and Congress is there to complain, and the political elites are there to complain. The media is there to, you know, dig out what we can find. And, and you know, put it out in public, uh, or do you really think there's some alternative um, universe that uh, would would work better? No, I, I was being descriptive, but that is an accurate description. All right, and I and I put it in there number one because I feel it. All right, but number two, good people then get swept up when that pendulum comes swinging back. Good people who have done only what was expected of them when everyone was an extremist, when everyone felt that they, they were in danger. And so this was my argument that, that yeah, okay, fine. Ch I'll give you an example, okay? President Obama comes in, issues an executive order on day two, closing the CIA detention sites. Truth in lending, it's in the book. I argued against it. Keep your options open, Mr. President. You can never tell. But he didn't. He closed it. I issued a memo to every CIA employee within minutes of the president issuing the executive order saying, the president has given us exactly what we need. The president has given us clear guidance. The guidance is different than the one we had previously been working under. I may have said something about the box we're working in is going to be smaller than the box we formerly worked in. We will absolutely respect that box. We will operate as aggress aggressively as we did in the old box within the new box, but we will work inside the new box. That's how it should work. Within months of that, 
The Department of Justice releases memos about the CIA detention and interrogation program, releases an IG report, releases another dump of mem memos in August of 2009, all designed to have that pendulum swing back and sweep up the people who were in its way. What the president, what my sense of the legitimacy of the president was, he said, I don't agree with that. We're not doing that anymore. Move on. But that's not what happened, and that's why I wrote the sentence. Right. No, I, I, com I completely understand that. I mean, I have to say that my complaint when they released those memos and that IG report was it was too heavily redacted. But, um, but, uh, but I, you know, I hear what you're saying. So, so let's um, move to your questions. Um, y you know, uh, please do keep it. Uh, there's a lot of people here, I'm sure, with a lot of questions. Go to one of the two microphones, and um, please keep it tight and, and make it a question, if you don't mind. Uh, briefly, um, I was wondering if you could describe the two different transitions in the CIA, one from your predecessor to you and from you to your uh, who followed you. Sure. So I, I followed Porter Goss, and, and, and frankly, I, I went in with the agency under stress. I think I actually used the line of the book, it seemed to have battered child syndrome. All right? It, 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 the weapons of mass destruction, NIE, uh, the Pulitzer Prize winning stories uh, of Dana Priest about renditions and detentions and, and, and so on. And, and unfortunately, I think and Porter's a great human being and is actually my friend, but there was a separation between him and the workforce uh, that was very unfortunate. And his number three had police tape around his office subject to an FBI investigation about uh, bad contracting. So I went in there, my first line to the workforce, I, I'm in the bubble talking to them, and my first line is settle down, blow into the paper bag, get your CO2 levels back to normal, go back to work. So that was, that was my task. I think I handed off to Leon, and this may be a little self-referential, a pretty smoothly functioning organization, all right? Leon, however, did things I could never do. Leon was, Number one, he was the appointee of a Democratic president. He was a former Democratic member of Congress. And so when that pendulum swung back, I complained about it in the private sector. But Leon went toe-to-toe -to -toe with the Democratic majority, defending the same people I was trying to defend. And so I, I gave him very high marks. So anyway, those are the two transitions. So take one over here. First, I want to thank you for being here and for all the work you've done through the years protecting thank us. Thank you. Uh, I have two related questions. One is why there wasn't a risk analysis done when NSA was collecting all that data. In, in other words, when we're collecting Angela Merkel's telephone calls or the president of Mexico's calls or Pemex or Petrobras, why? How, well, by the way, in my point of view, some of those are not offensive, but okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm not trying to offend you, actually. I'm, I'm, I'm a supporter. I've, I've worked for yeah. the government all my life, and, I, and I'm a strong – so I'm not on, in the opposite. But you're saying a risk analysis of what the downside would be? Is the, is, the, mm -hmm. is the game worth the candle? Yeah. Is, yeah. That's the question. And, okay. then, and my second question, yeah. <clears throat> my second question is Frontline ran a program a, a while back on NSA, and they basically said – I believe it was five employees within NSA and one woman staff member on the Senate. On the HIPSI, yeah. yeah. House, uh, House Committee. Or the House, one of the, on, in Congress on one of the Intelligence Committees, all knew about the excessively broad scope of this collection, and they all went within channels, within to their superiors, <clears throat> and said, we got to cut this back. Uh, and the result, the response was that for all, all of these people, the FBI was there within a couple of days kicking in their door, taking away their computers, their files, their disks, the works. I got it. And uh, it? Only, only, only one of them was ever indicted. None of the rest were, and none of them ever got their stuff yeah. back. So the risk, and the risk one who was indicted we never got, went we to it. trial. Okay, yeah. So yeah. Well, anyway, risk analysis but, okay. and then the but NSA, NSA. NSA never refused to even speak on that okay. front line. Oh, here okay. you go. Okay, okay. Here, so All here right. we have it. So on the risk analysis, right, I'm either confirming or denying whose cell phone anybody in the world listens to, all right? But you do do sensitive things, and there's always a political risk for blowback. I had political guidance as director. Condi Rice told me, no, 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 you're not doing that target. 
All right? So there's always political guidance. But there's a calculus. How bad the blowback, how likely the discovery. And in these instances that you are alleging, the likelihood of discovery by the target is zero. <laughs> okay? We will never again assume that the likelihood of discovery is zero. <laughs> All right? And that's, that's part of the calculus. In terms of what you're describing, I'll be very brief. You're talking about the thin thread, pro thin thread program. It was very contentious. All right? When they went to the IG and complained that what we were doing was wrong, the IG could appropriately say it wasn't wrong. The Attorney General has approved it. The President has authorized it. And oh, by the way, the FISA chief FISA judge is aware of it. And so claims of illegality fall flat. By the way, Edward Snowden had the same problem. He, didn't, he could not point out anything that NSA was doing was illegal. It's just he didn't like it. So, and so, so let, me, let me just finish. I would have not launched the FBI. No, sorry. Thin Thread was a technological dispute that those five people turned into a moral crusade. As a result of the moral crusade, that ended up in felony charges in federal court. I think it was as wrong to this, to this, for this to end up in felony charges as it was for them to take a technological dispute and turn it into a morality play. Okay, let's take one from this side. Yes, Mr. Hayden, I have a question. Uh, in 2002 and 2003, the American public through major media was led to believe that we had absolute proof that uh, Saddam Hussein had weapons of mass destruction. <coughs> Now, during the course of the war, it turned out that he didn't. It was, and we were also told through the major media that intelligence agencies all around the world of many different countries also had separate proof of weapons of mass destruction that they had separately developed this intelligence. Then after, the, after we found that there was none, I imagine that the CIA and other agencies in the U.S. government uh, did a complete investigation as to how we could have been so misled. And I'm sure that all the other intelligence agencies of other countries around the world also did the same. I do not remember ever seeing a report as to what we determined had happened to our intelligence agency and our intelligence, nor have I seen reports of all the other countries since okay. they had separate intelligence. That's and I'm great. just wondering yeah. what, uh, what actually happened with all these investigations. Yeah, so, so to, I think everyone's, everyone's familiar, we got it wrong on the weapons of mass destruction, all right? Uh, Big time. Uh, Big hmm? time. Yeah, we were wrong. I, I clearly indicated in the book, we were wrong. No one held a gun to our head and said, we want you to say that Iran, Iraq has weapons of mass destruction. In the book, I, I go to Leon on my last meeting with him because he had said as, that much in the private sector. I said, Leon, you got to stop saying that, okay? We weren't under pressure. We just got it wrong. It was our fault. A little bit in extenuation, every other intelligence service worth their salt around the world actually thought so too, all right? Our sourcing was weak. We learned from that. And, and frankly, I point out in the book, the great sin, all right, was not just being wrong, which is bad enough, but we did not communicate ambiguity to our client. We, 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 we did not, I mean, if you read that report, right, and I use it in my class at George Mason, I put it up on the board and said, now read, this, read these words, because all the key judgments are unclassified now. I, I said, look at that. It's dripping with, with confidence. It, it's like they were on tablets coming down from Sinai. And we never should have let our customers believe, assume, we had that much confidence in the estimate. So that, to me, is, is, is the greater of, of the two flaws. Um, this was before I was at CIA, but Jamie Missick was the head of analysis. Jamie turned everything upside down to go through our tradecraft in our analysis as to why we so thinly sourced came up with the conclusions we came up with. And, and that's now become part of how CIA does, does analysis. There was also a, a public commission that did a big, thick book yeah. on this, yeah. too. Yeah, the WMD commission. Um, but but what know, conclusions every, did the other countries come to in their I, investigations? I, I do not know yeah. what they did the in British their own did internal one. looks. Yeah. Yeah. They, they, I was just going to say, yeah. everything that's been asked about so far is actually covered in some detail in the book, remarkably enough. Good evening, General Hayden. Yeah. Um, I'm part of the pulse of the culture you referenced a few minutes ago because I talk to people almost every day about whether we're being wiretapped or who's being wiretapped. <coughs> so Americans that I've talked to cherish their freedom of privacy. We want privacy. We don't want our phone calls and emails spied on. 
Many Americans believe you and others in the intelligence apparatus view or have viewed Americans, some, sometimes all Americans, as potential terrorists. Now, I understand there are people hidden cells or whatever you say there are, and, but, but, but all of us are not terrorists, okay, guaranteed. So thanks to Edward Snowden, we were awakened to this reality, whether we like Edward Snowden, we would think he broke the law or not. He awakened us, and there was little transparency. We're talking about transparency tonight, but there was also. My question is, General Hayden, are you saying tonight that the NSA has taken a U-turn from your policies aimed at the United States citizens? No, because we weren't aimed at United States citizens. I mean, you're protected by the Fourth Amendment. Fourth Amendment sacred. I, I, I take great pains in the book to, to try to explain the culture of, of NSA. Um, I, 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 can I ask just a follow on? You, you give me the offense that you're aware of that NSA has committed against American privacy. Well, we don't have 30,000 people on this side of the ledger with billions of dollars in the world's supercomputers to check on you. Okay, thanks to Snowden. Like I said earlier, for good or bad, I'm, he I'm said asking this, you, this was going I'm on. I'm asking you, based on well, Snowden, well, tell me the offense. Let's say the phone, phone call logs of millions of Americans okay. calling each other. Good. So you've got, you've got, unarguably, you've got the calling events of Americans built up over years. Program I started about four weeks after 9-11. After now, sorry to pull you down through the knot hole of detail here, but it matters. The Supreme Court in 1979 in a five to three vote, declared that metadata, that's that, is not constitutionally protected. That it is not, that you do not have a reasonable expectation of privacy with records that are actually the property of the phone company, not of you. But still being very sensitive to American privacy, we got this ocean of calling events and fenced them off from everybody inside NSA. About two dozen people in NSA are authorized, were authorized to access that database, all right? We had constant keystroke monitoring on all the access points so that people could oversee to make sure nothing was, was done that was untoward. The only way you could access the database, the urban legend out there is you ran algorithms against it like we were Google, all right? Uh, and, and you could build relationships and, and, and build up suspicion. No. The only way you access the database was if you had another number, it's called the seed number, that you had a, quote, reasonable, articulable suspicion that that number was associated with international terrorism. You know, roll up a safe house in Yemen, you got a bad guy, he's got a cell phone, you've never seen it before, it's a new number, gee, I wonder if it's called America. So you get to go to the transom where this database is held and say, hey, anybody in here talk to this phone? And if a phone, say, in the Bronx says, yeah, about every Thursday, then NSA gets to say, so who do you talk to? And now that's it. That is all that is done with that data. Now, I get it. It is a legitimate position if you find that offensive. And many Americans feel this way. No, I, I, I get it. But it was the lightest touch we could, I could develop to answer what that Congress said was the greatest failing of NSA prior to 9-11, which was its failure to trace the terrorist calls that should have been most important. This is literally from the report. Terrorist calls, one end of which was in the United States. So, I mean, look, we share values, Thank but you. I don't think we share the same data. Thank you, General. Thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, good evening, General. Um, just have a question. Uh, well, I share the sentiments of uh, the last questioner. I'm curious, uh, to what extent has a harm been to our intelligence gathering and our influence with allies and adversaries following the NSA surveillance leaks? How about Snowden leaks writ large? Yeah. Yeah. All right, quick summary. Edward Snowden's leaks are the greatest hemorrhaging of legitimate American secrets in the history of the republic. And, 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 and you can make an argument that he accelerated a public discussion, and, and the gentleman over here pointed out some things that touch upon American privacy. I get it. They do. Mm -hmm. All right? I have a view, but no question. It touches on American privacy. 98% of what Snowden pushed out the door was how this country collects intelligence against foreign targets. What, it, what is the American privacy quotient of making public that the National Security Agency has access to the unclassified emails of the Syrian armed forces? 
or that NSA and GCHQ, our British counterpart, intercepted the satellite phone of Dmitry Medvedev during a G20 conference in England. I mean, what does that have to do with your privacy or mine? So it has been tremendously, tremendously destructive. Yet there's another question. I forgot it. Oh, well, it was uh, one, first the second half, which I believe you've addressed with allies and adversaries. Oh, yeah, the impact on allies. All right. Okay. So, so there, there, there's a, an urban legend out there that, that um, the fact that we may or may not have been listening to Chancellor Merkel's cell phone is really poisoned relationships when it comes to our re intelligence relationship, say, with the, with the BND. The, the German service. Yeah. Um, actually, what affects our relationship with our foreign service counterparts mm -hmm. is not what we do. It's the fact that it appears we can't keep what we do secret. Yeah. And why would you want to work with these guys on something a little edgy? Because he's going to write about it. <laughs> right. Thank you. Sir. Uh, General Hayden, do you miss being in the political arena, and would you consider getting back into the arena? No, and no. <laughs> <laughs> my, my wife's here. I, she's, I occasionally get this question, what do you miss? I miss the mission. I miss the people. And from time to time, I miss the jet. <laughs> Sir. General, this is more along the lines of a personal question. Sure. I imagine you had some sleepless nights when you're in your previous positions. Now that you don't have that information stream, is it easier or harder to sleep? <laughs> that's a great. That's a great question. I, because of my background, not not any virtue here, okay, but because of my background, I can read through Scott's stories. I, I can see things behind the screen that perhaps even Scott is not aware of. <laughs> that no, I'm, I mean it. I, I, I believe you, it. You know, <laughs> that, that he is not aware of. And so I, I actually feel fairly current. Let me give you another one that might actually really puzzle you, all right? There is so much information available in the modern world that I actually think our intelligence services do a disservice to themselves by kind of huddling up and, and pulling themselves under the cloak and relying on only those things that they steal rather than things that are more generally available. Here's the line. I've lost contact on some tactical detail. But Mike Hayden tonight knows more things about more stuff globally than I did my last day as CIA director. Was that because you were too busy as CIA? Yeah, you're to pay consumed. Attention to you're consumed by the secret yeah. stuff, yeah. and now I get to do this, or I get to go to a conference in Vail about, about, about global energy. Or I mean, you just get to harvest all the things. So one of the major muscle movements that American intelligence has to do, not just to be more open to get your confidence, they need to be more open to learn what you know, in terms of your wisdom. Uh, I say this to business audiences. You guys know more about the People's Republic of China than the American intelligence community. Do you ever think about calling them up and offering to share that's what you've learned? That's, that's, <laughs> that's, that's, that's the plan. That's the plan that the community needs to have a more permeable membrane yeah. between itself and the larger society. Uh, Brad, can, I'll go we, fast. can we go a little, a little bit? I'll, okay. I'll be efficient. Okay. Sorry. Great. Please, this will be the lightning round if you can go. make it real fast. Sure. Um, based on uh, based on what you know, and uh, on, on, on when you first heard about the uh, Hillary Clinton's private uh, yeah. server, and uh, wh what were your first thoughts when you first heard about it? And do you think that she should be charged, or if this is overblown? Okay, so. You need to watch Brett Baer tonight on your DVR because he asked me the same question about an hour before I got here. Um, anybody with my background, and I've talked to a lot of people with my background, find the existence of that arrangement absolutely inexplicable and find the explanation of that arrangement absolutely in, incomprehensible. Right? And, and what I said on, on, on Brett Baer tonight was the sin here, the real sin, is the original sin. Once you set it up that the secretary's official emails are going to a private server, and I mean this, nobody has to be bad or stupid or ill-intentioned. This is let's just like that show in Albuquerque, all right? This is breaking bad, naturally, and it's going to end up in a bad place. So that's, that's one reality. The second reality, and I actually said this on TV, shared by everybody I know of my background, I would lose all respect for a whole bunch of intelligence services around the world if they weren't harvesting every one of those emails. And then the third point I'd make is, if I could have had access to, say, Sergey Lavrov's unclassified email system, I'd have moved heaven and earth 
to, to get access to it. Now, with regard to what happens, this is in the hands of Jim Comey. And if you read the book, Jim and I didn't FBI always director. Yeah. Jim and I didn't always agree. <laughs> okay? True. All right? But Jim is a highly principled man. This investigation is in good hands. So film at eleven, as they used to say. Just quick follow up. Um, the Clinton campaign, Clinton herself, will point out Condi Rice as well as past administrations yeah. um, with, who are in, in her yeah. position. They, to they, do they're, this. Not, they're not really comparable examples. All right. Can you explain why quickly? Yeah, it's just a sense of scale. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. Email has grown a great deal over yeah. the years. Yeah. Sir. Hi, uh, General. It's a pleasure to get to speak to you tonight. Thank um, you. Historically speaking, in counterintelligence, the greatest fear has been penetration by a foreign service. But in the United States, with the increasing political culture that is against secrecy or adverse to secrecy, which has always been a CI challenge for Americans, do you think that this insider threat is approaching the same level of ubiquity that foreign intelligence penetration has been? Yeah, and that's a, you, made a, you made an excellent decision or distinction. The insider threat as opposed to foreign intelligence penetration, it's different. So again, my second life, I get to learn things. So I'm a fellow at the U.S. Chamber. We're out at the Greenbrier. Second life is good. Um, <laughs> we're out at the Greenbrier, and for a full morning, we have a presentation for American industry where I get to sit in on the greatest generation, boomers, so on, X, Gen Y, millennials. All right, and the, the, the guy, wonderful presentation. And he's going through the presentation. He's up to a millennials. All right, and explaining how they think. And my wife's in the back row there. I turned to her and said, damn, NSA is going to hire more Edward Snowdens. Okay. Yeah. It's, it's just the nature of the, of the recruiting base. And we're going to get people in there who, who have that young man's view towards privacy. I'm being non judgment men over here. I'm just being descriptive. He's going to have that generation's view towards privacy and loyalty and so on. Not like the boomers, not like the greatest generation. So, yeah, this is a long-term issue. Thank you, sir. Go ahead. Hello. General Hayden, um, I'm going to toss you a softball, if you don't mind. Okay. Um, we served together in Bulgaria in the late 80s, uh, not long before the, uh, before the communist regime there collapsed. And I recall you as a very energetic and creative and uh, active Air Force attache. And um, one of the pieces. That's in the book, too. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I read the two pages. So. <laughs> but um, what, I, um, what I wanted to uh, ask was what, from your experience in Bulgaria, carried forward as you yeah. advanced to ever higher uh, responsibilities. I remember one piece of advice that you had, which was never let the gas in your gas tank get below half. And uh, there may be some other uh, bits of wisdom that you can impart. How about uh, watch the weather forecast? <laughs> <laughs> he and I went on a collection trip in Bulgaria. I'm, I'm the GI. He just well, we want to experience what it is you guys do. We drive across the country and there's a blizzard coming in behind us. We cannot get back to Sofia. Mm -hmm. We spent the night on a train in which our feet were actually in frozen water trying to get back to the capital. And, and I was sitting next to two North Koreans. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so so what, what, what did I learn? Um, <clears throat> what I learned was the, the tremendous advantage that cultural and linguistic agility give an intelligence service, and I don't mean to be overly aggressive here, I just simply mean to understand what is going on, that you're not taking it through the filter of taking it out of the host language and putting it in, into your language. And so I, I actually used that when I talked to our outgoing station chiefs and, and, and talked about the, 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 the importance of, 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 of being of the, the local culture as much as, much as you can. We, we pushed analysts out, this is an unusual program, we pushed analysts out of the headquarters. Right, I went to my chief of uh, an analysis and said, I know how long it takes America's army to, gr to grow a battalion commander, 20 years. All right? How long does it take you to grow an analyst with 20 years experience? And he gave me the wrong answer. <laughs> okay? I said, no, John, that's too long. We, we can't wait 20 years to get an analyst with 20 years experience. So, John, what we did was we pushed him out so that they had to speak the local language, the first thing they saw in the morning was the local newspaper. The last thing they saw at night was the local newscast. And they, it accelerated the deeper understanding of, of the society. So that, I, I pulled that out of Bulgaria. Thanks, Thanks so much. Good. Is there a question over here? Or? No. no, yeah. Okay. okay, next. Hi. Um, my question is, um, I'm going to invite some uh, comment and maybe some speculation. Um, back in November, 
Uh, Vladimir Putin's media guy was found dead in uh, a hotel. You know the story probably, I'm sure. Um, DuPont Circle. Um, it has been under covered in the press. Scott, maybe there's an opportunity here. Um, I'm fascinated by it because um, he's the media guy. He was under invest He's in Washington. He was under investigation for money laundering, putting money into the U.S. Uh, the Obama administration is silent about it. Um, the press has been silent. I don't know whether it's hands-off guys. I'd just like you to comment yeah. on that story. Yeah, I mean, the, the real answer is I don't know. I mean, I, I really don't know any of the facts of the case. I mean, I'm aware of the case, but I don't know anything I mean, more than you've Putin read. Hit, is that possible? Yeah, I mean, of course it's possible. I uh, mean, I mean, the British government has determined that he killed Litvinenko. Oh, absolutely. With plutonium in, in London, so, yeah. Okay. And I, I, how do I put this? I have no reason to disbelieve that theory. Okay, that's my theory. <laughs> I'm sticking with it. And from, from a press point of view, um, you, you know, um, we have done some reporting on that. No one, no one tells us, thank God, from the U.S. government, you know, what to do. <clears throat> Um, so we certainly have poked around. We haven't been able to find out anything interesting. Sometimes there's a saying in journalism, something is too good to check, which just means <laughs> it's a great story until you check it out and you find out the guy had a heart condition and so on and so forth. Um, there's you no know, corner report. You, you can go on. You can I go think. on the internet and find that Justice Scalia, uh, you know, uh, okay, was I murdered. Saw it. I saw it. And and uh, <laughs> you know, uh, that that was too good to check. So you know, but but it's a great story, potentially a fantastic story. So we'll keep working on it. Okay. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you, General Hayden, for coming tonight. Um, thank you. You're speaking about torture, enhanced interrogation. And I found your comments a little bit disingenuous when you said there were, you said we cited six techniques, the slap, the pinch, and the other two. Uh, first of all, I can't conceive that there was such a slight slap on the cheek. I mean, is it real? Is that for real? But okay, you meant, you failed to mention several other techniques. For example, the use of dogs against Muslims who are can't stand the sight of dogs. Sec and I'm a pet owner, so I appreciate dogs. Secondly, uh, the use of plastic bags over the head. And the third, to me, is the most disturbing of all, is uh, anal rehydration. Could you speak about that? And then s I have a follow-up. Sure. Um, what I was referring to was the six techniques that I went to the Department of Justice for an opinion on. This is probably mid-07, and it was those six. There were, there were other techniques that were used, water dousing, cramp confinement, uh, stress positions, waterboarding, and so on. Those are the ones we took off the table. Uh, the dog thing was never ours. There, there's no record of CIA. There are photos of the dog. That was at Abu, Abu Ghraib, yeah. which that's, was that's a military only. thing. Yeah, and, and mm -hmm. rectal rehydration, when I saw that in the CICER report, I was surprised. I asked, I asked the agency about it. I, I did not get a, a rich answer, uh, but, it, but, it, but basically it was along the lines of the one guy, Majid Khan, all right, was ripping his tubes out and was violently resisting. And, and, the, the, and, and what I was told, again, I'm just transmitting what I was told, what I was told was that was the medically indicated solution to rehydrating someone who was refusing all other forms of care. Thanks. What's your follow-up? My follow-up is quickly, um, uh, among the revelations by, by uh, um, uh, I'm sorry, Mr. Henry uh, Snowden? Uh, Edward Snowden, who I regard as a hero for what he's done, um, is that uh, he, he spoke about at least one document he released. There are six levels of, of sec secrecy above the reach of the president. Is this, is this true? No. The it was it was an NSA document. No, the, the the president has access to anything he wants to have access to, and in fact, and this is this is Scott's problem, he is the god of classification authority. He I mean, all classification authority devolves from the president, and it doesn't go to the Congress, right. which becomes contentious. If it comes out of the president's mouth, it's declassified as he says the words. Yeah. So all power to classify and declassify emanate from the presidential pow president's powers. Thanks. We got a gentleman behind you. Yeah. This better be the last question for General Hayden. Could you tell us where you stand in the uh, on the uh, Apple versus the FBI? I am Apple versus FBI. For yeah. those who didn't hear that, 
I am broadly with Apple. All right. Um, I actually think that the Bureau may have a case in one phone, one time. They're not asking Apple to break it. They're asking Apple to suppress the self-destruction mechanism. All right. But, but the broader argument, all right, that, that, that we, we should have back doors into otherwise secure systems on security grounds, all right? I can, I can argue this on privacy, all right? But I'm not. I'm doing this as a security guy because that's where my background is. On security grounds, I think America is more secure with unbreakable end-to-end -end encryption. I know what I would do as director if anybody put a back door in anything. The first thing I would say was, thank you, Jesus, okay? Because I'm coming, I'm coming after that door. It, it doesn't guarantee I'm getting in, but it gives me additional capacity. Right? Jim Clapper, the director of national intelligence, for the last three years has said the primary threat to the United States is cyber. Okay? Now, I get Director Comey's problems. I get the threat of terrorism. I get the threat of crime. But if the DNI says the primary thing that keeps him awake at night is cyber threat, why would you weaken your cyber defense potential, even if it were a good idea for these other problems over here? And so I, I, I'm broadly with uh, Tim Cook and Apple. I, I, am not, I am not convinced that what's happening in San Bernardino is what I just told you. And there, therefore, it's the burden of proof on Apple to show me you, all right, that if they do this, it leads to that. But I am opposed to that. By the way, so is another former director of NSA, Mike McConnell. So is the former Homeland Security Secretary, Mike Chertoff. Thanks for that very interesting uh, set of answers. And <laughs> I think General Hayden might be willing to hang around and sign some books.